scientist, consultant, author, and lecturer. He has served as the elected coroner of Allegheny County from 1970 <coughs> to 1980, as well as 1996 to 2006. Dr. Weck is a clinical professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, an adjunct professor at the Graduate School of Public Health, an adjunct professor at Duquesne University Schools of Law, Pharmacy, and Health Sciences. I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Cyril Weck. It's uh, been impossible to pick up newspaper, uh, three national newspapers every day, the New York Times, Washington, uh, New York Times, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal, and the post executive and Tribune Review, and local papers, television programs. I just did um, a couple of interviews uh, this morning and one last night, and uh, one uh, tonight with uh, Al Jazeera. That's interesting, by the way. Uh, and I don't say this uh, in any egotistical way. It's, it's not because it's me, it's because of the case. But I have had interviews uh, from uh, Brazil, Australia, uh, England, uh, Canada, uh, Taiwan, um, uh, and uh, two or three others. The significance of it is that the world is very much aware of the assassination of President Kennedy and uh, has maintained an interest. And I will tell you that um, if you were to conduct a poll in countries around the world, you will find an even higher percentage of people in other countries. And I don't care uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, wherever, Scandinavia, Benelux, Asia, Africa, uh, Israel, it doesn't make any difference. The percentage of people who do not believe the war commission report is greater than it is in the United States. And that is saying something because a poll conducted by the History Journal, it will be shown, by the way, uh, as part of their program on Friday of this week. I'm not sure what the time of the day is, but the History Journal, look for it. It should be a good program. As I sat there in the chair, in October of last year in New York City, following the uh, hour and a half or so interview, they wanted to tell me uh, the results of a poll they had commissioned of 2,200 people. And they deliberately waited until I was finished talking. And they told me they had done the same thing with the other people whom they had interviewed and were scheduled to interview in the next couple of days before that program to be shown uh, this Friday. 85% of the American public did not accept the Warren Commission conclusions, conclusions regarding the Harvey Oswald as the sole assassin, etc. A poll uh, conducted <coughs> by one of the establishment news media more recently, even they, and you know, polls frequently produce results that you want. Even that poll, which was not designed to elicit the greatest number of uh, the people who do not accept the word of report, even that poll reported 59% versus 24% who accept it. This has been true since the late 60s to the present time in every national poll. Why? I'm always asked why. How can that be? Uh, what does it mean? And so on. Well, uh, sure, is it hard science? It's not hard science. But how many things can you think of? that over a period of five decades remains uh, the view of a substantial majority, whether it's 60% or 85%, the average has been 70 to 75%, that have maintained a view on a particular point, despite the continuing intensive efforts manifested and conducted in many ways, not just uh, open in terms of presentations and arguments presented by their uh, supporters and sycophantic, uh, parasitic uh, defenders, but in many ways of a surreptitious, clandestine, uh, highly uh, unethical, if indeed not illegal fashion. 
how many things can you think of? That tells you a great deal because it, it spans white, black, uh, male, female, northern or southerner, a liberal Democrat, conservative Republican, Catholic, uh, Protestant, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist. It spans, obviously. When you have numbers that the pick two thirds uh, to uh, more than four fifths of the American public believe in something, you can't have those numbers unless you have a majority of just about every single group in the United States. Why? All right, let's talk about the case. Maybe you'll understand better why. Let's start with the assassination. Let's start with the events leading, leading up to it. First of all, you've got to know what it was like in Dallas. It was a city of political, vehement hatred. Adlai Stevenson, twice nominee for the presidency of the United States on the Democratic ticket, then our ambassador to the United Nations, had been physically jostled and spat upon and insulted on the streets of Dallas a short time before the president had arrived, a matter of a week or so. One of the oil billionaires had paid for it and had distributed tens of thousands of handbills with a picture of Kennedy and the caption beneath one of the treason, the kind that you see on post office walls for the 10 most wanted criminals. The largest downtown newspaper had received payment for it and published a full page ad with a black red border suggesting nothing less than an obituary notice attacking Kennedy in the most scurrilous language. Hmm. The anti Catholicism still permeated the South by no means had it been uh, dispelled uh, or significantly diminished just because Kennedy had won in 1960. But the one point that I always make and I always remind myself of, myself of that depicts this vehement hatred more than anything, and we don't know the extent because these weren't being monitored like an election in some third world country with UN people posted all over. But I have over the years come to speak with many people who have written to me and call and talk and met in meetings and so on. I don't know what the extent was, but it's, it was very, very extensive throughout the South. In elementary schools and high schools, when it was announced to kids that day in the South, the President of the United States, their country had been killed, school children burst out into applause. Now, where does that come from? You know, the South Pacific song, you've got to be taught to hate, and that's what it is. Today, there are a lot of people who despise Obama. There are a lot of people who despise the Tea Party. I can't envision an American audience of a public nature bursting out into applause if you heard that Obama was killed or that Senators uh, Rubio and Cruz um, and, and Paul had been assassinated on the other side of the political spectrum. But this is what existed. In order to understand history, you've got to know what took place. Just to read about an event, somebody discovered this, somebody invented that or so on. What do you, how, what do you really know? You read about a particular battle, the battles, the great battles of Fort Duquesne and Fort Pitt with the Indians. To understand it, how do we treat the Native Americans? What was it all about? What, 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 what went on in this country? This is as an example, okay? And this is why I stress this. You've got to understand what was going on, what the feelings and the attitudes were. So Kennedy went because he was a courageous person. He was a damn good politician. He knew that Texas was a key state. Texas, in addition to the problems I just cited, was divided between the Democrat, Democratic Party of the conservative Governor John Conley and the somewhat more liberal Senator, U.S. Senator Ralph Yarborough. So he had that rift to deal with. And he went. They finished in San Antonio and Fort Worth the day before. They flew over to the old uh, field, that was the previous airfield before the uh, Dallas Fort Worth airport was built, and uh, the cavalcade, the motorcade lined up. The clouds uh, were passing, the sun was beginning to come out. It was looking like a pretty good day. And as a matter of fact, the decision was made to remove the bubble so the president could have more intimate personal exposure uh, to the crowds, which were large. And the crowds turned out to be extremely favorable and friendly. They loved Jackie Kennedy in her two piece uh, pink suit. And it was turning out to be a very successful presentation. The last words that were ever spoken to John Kennedy one on one when Nellie Conley, the governor's wife, seated to his left in front of Jackie, turned over her right shoulder and said to the president, sitting diagonally behind her, Mr. President, you can't say the people of Dallas don't love you. The last words. 
At 12.30 Central Time, 1.30 here, shots rang out. Kennedy is struck, his hands move up thusly. Many of you have seen this Zapruder film, I'm sure. Then John Connolly is hit. Then you see this crimson burst as the president's head literally explodes and um, the cars then rush off, arriving at Parkland Hospital five minutes away. A major trauma center, as it turned out, some 18 physicians, specialists in all fields were there. They did what they could, but there was nothing that could be done to save the president. In fact, those were the exact words of Dr. Kim Clark, chief of neurosurgery, who was called in upon examining the head wounds and said, there is nothing that can be done to save this man. There then ensued an ugly situation the local officials were there to assume jurisdiction of the body, which was legally theirs under the laws of Dallas and Texas. The feds, with hands on guns, profanity, physical press, and even some physical jostling, uh, pushed aside the medical examiner, Dr. Earl Rose, whom I knew. Uh, he was a colleague of mine. He was about a year or two older than I. He was already the chief medical examiner of Dallas. And they pushed him up against the wall. And you know who's going to prevail in that situation. They forced their way up with the body of the president. They went out to Love Field. Johnson was sworn in as president. Jackie Kennedy <coughs> in her blood stained suit came up from the rear of the plane, a coffin of her husband, who stood by him for those couple of minutes while he was sworn in by federal judge Sarah Hughes. And then she went back to be named at the tail of the plane with her husband's body. The plane took off then to Washington, D.C. Now, there are cases where the passage of time can be catastrophic in terms of trying to understand what happened in the case. And I'll give you two examples. We'll talk about those another time with your forensic science class. O.J. Simpson and John Bede Ramsey, both cases screwed up badly because the medical examiner, forensic pathologist, forensic scientist were not called there, did not examine the body, did not determine the time of death and other things. It wasn't the problem here. We knew when the president was struck, we knew that he was killed by gunfire, so that was not a problem. As a matter of fact, the antithesis really was in play because that gave them more time to get their act together, to figure out exactly what was going to be done, and most importantly, to bring together the foremost experienced forensic pathologists in the country to do this autopsy. Determine the number of shots, the angle, the distance, the trajectory, the sequence, and then to correlate those wounds with the multiple wounds in Governor John Connolly. That was a formidable task. A trio of the most knowledgeable, experienced forensic pathologists in the country would have had a difficult time dealing with that kind of a situation. So I want you to know, and especially, and this is a microcosm of the American public, and 10, 15, 20 percent of you may still believe the word fish report because it came from the government and so on. I want you to know what you start with. I want you to know what your burden is if you are a believer in the Warren Commission report. If you was in Boswell, the two naval pathologists, career naval pathologists at Bethesda Naval Center where the autopsy was performed, had never done a single gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. Speaking today, I don't know how many times I've spoken about this, thousands of times and written and done. I still burn inside as an American citizen. You don't have to be, I happen to be a Democrat. I would feel the same way if I were a Republican. It makes no difference to think that in my country, in 1963, a president assassinated with these kinds of questions to be answered, to be dealt with, this kind of investigation to be undertaken, that the government had the, the audacity, the temerity, the indifference, the insensitivity, the stupidity to call in two people who had never done a gunshot wound autopsy in their entire careers. Absolutely incredible. Well, is there a point of my criticism or is it just uh, intellectual, condescending, arrogant criticism uh, that uh, I expressed in such a strong fashion. Well, let's see. What did they do? What did they see that night? At Parkland Hospital, what did the doctors do? And what did they see? They saw a wound here at the anterior midline of the neck at the level of the knot at the top. And then they saw a big gaping defect on the right side of the head. The president was not further undressed, and that was it. Then that night at the autopsy, uh, these uh, the pathologists, they um, uh, did undress the president, 
and they found a bullet wound on his back, a few inches below the level of the crest of the shoulder, slightly to the right of the midline. They probed with their fingers, inserted an index finger, full length, and felt nothing. They took probes and inserted them and felt nothing, touched nothing. They took x-rays and, and saw nothing. They did the autopsy, removed the lungs, dissected them, and found nothing. They saw a big gaping defect on the side of the head. They claimed to have found a smaller separate wound at the base of the skull, the external occipital protuberance. That's one of the bony prominences at the base of your skull, one on the right and the left. They concluded, having put together, they claimed pieces of bone, one from the driveway, one from the car, one from Jack Kennedy, which he reached over. If you're seeing this in Buderville, and she's climbing over the back, she's reaching up to grab brain tissue and skull, and she held on to a piece of skull. She had it all the way to the hospital when it was taken from her. So they concluded that a bullet had struck the president in the back of the head and had exited then uh, toward the right front side. What to do about the bullet hole in the back? Well, information came in from the FBI, transmitted uh, to the FBI in DC, and then to the pathologist that while the that a, a maintenance man by the name of Ray Tomlinson back at Parkland Hospital a couple of hours after the entourage had left, trying to get to the men's room, found the corridor blocked by the ER, bent down, moved the stretchers, and lo and behold, there was a bullet. The information then transmitted to Hughes and Boswell, and this was their conclusion, that when the president lay supine, hands up on his back, and the doctors applied pressure to the front of his chest for external cardiac massage. That pressure applied to the front of his chest and forced the bullet that they knew had gone deeply beyond the length of the finger back out through the same channel. Bullets do not do that. <laughs> bullets become encased, they become captured by swollen tissue, by hemorrhagic tissue. It's not like going into the fork pit or Liberty Tunnels and you decide you're going the wrong way and you put the car in reverse and you back out. Bullets do not fly <laughs> out of the wounds. When I talk about a bullet, bullet floating around in the sea of blood and the abdominal cavity, I'm talking a ball about a bullet that is within tissues. Bullets do not move around. They remain there and you got to dig. I just did a couple of homicides suicide from Westmoreland County last week. Each of the two victims was shot six times and uh, it was a hell of a job to find all those bullets to establish entrance and exit wounds, etc. So those were their conclusions. They submitted those reports to President Johnson and Jagger Hoover, director of the FBI that night, and they went home. The next morning, they called the doctors in Dallas, Dr. Perry, the head doctor, whom they had not spoken to. They had all that time to get everything in place on Friday, while the plane was flying back and everything was being taken care of, they never spoke with the doctors at Dallas. And now they learn for the first time what. How about that bullet hole in the front of the neck? Did I tell you that they saw that when they did the autopsy? I want you to take a look at the person sitting next to you, right or left. You think you've got to go to medical school for four years and do five, six years of pathology training to see a hole in somebody's neck? <laughs> well, how in the hell did they miss a hole in the neck? The doctors at Parkland had determined that the bullet that had ripped through the president's neck fortuitously had gone right through the trachea, the windpipe. When the brain has been significantly traumatized, or can be from a massive, naturally occurring stroke, and the brain can't function. You've got to take over the things that the brain does. The brain controls your lungs and your heart and everything else. <coughs> no matter how skilled the surgeons may be in dealing with wounds, no matter how wonderful they may be in undertaking their surgical procedures, if you don't do the job of the brain for the heart and lungs, the person's gonna die. They got carbon dioxide, you got to put in oxygen, you got to suction out of blood and mucus. So you do a tracheostomy. The doctor said, hey, we've got our trach already done. The bullet went through. The only problem was that the hole in the skin 
Here in the anterior midline, the level knot of, this, of the tie was too small to attach the cuff from the respirator machine. So they had to expand it. They didn't do it malevolently. They didn't do it to deceive uh, or obfuscate. They did the right thing. These guys that did the autopsy, totally inexperienced, having failed to talk with the doctors in Dallas, never knew until the next morning that they had missed a bullet hole in the front of the president's neck. Tell me, how would you handle that? You've done an autopsy on the president of the United States of America, dead as a result of gunshot wounds, and you have learned now, the next day, that you missed a bullet hole. What would you do? If you were in Asia, you would commit suicide. If you were in Europe, you'd resign. If you were in America, you'd just bullshit your way out of it. <laughs> so they said now, as of the next day, that the bullet was not from Kennedy's back, that it was now from Kennedy's neck. The bullet went through six inches of soft tissue, saw the starch white collar, got frightened to death, and plopped down in the front of his clothing. And that was the bullet that Mr. Thomas and then found. And by the way, if they had talked with the doctors in Dallas, they would have learned that no external cardiac massage was ever undertaken. Not that it would have made that kind of phenomenon a possibility, but no cardiac massage was ever applied. So now everything seems to be in place. Aha, uh -huh, we've got some real problems now. Two chronometers fall into place. Two temporal measuring entities of a separate nature to be correlated with each other. <clears throat> Abraham Zapruder, a woman's clothing merchant in Dallas, bought an eight millimeter bellhop camera that day. He went to Dealey Plaza. He stood on the ledge called the pergola. The secretary raised his leg. And when the cars came down Main Street, turned right onto Houston, and then left slightly downward and diagonally on Elm Street, that's Dealey Plaza, that's when Zapruder started his picture day. Except for the somewhat older, if we have any somewhat older faculty people here, uh, the younger folks don't know uh, what, what a film strip was like. You, you, you had a roll of film, and you put it into the inside of the camera. And you pulled out the film, you fit it into the sprockets, and, and then it moves in serpentine fashion, and then you close it up and you start your camera. That is the way cameras work. When you go to Kennywood Park, and you put in a coin, whatever it costs nowadays, uh, to see an old Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton movie, and you turn your crank. You see frame by frame, and you move fast, 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 and you get a movie. That's what the movie is made of, individual frames. So the Bellhop people and the FBI tested the camera separately and independently, and they agreed that 18.3 frames of that film strip moved through the camera per second. 18.3 frames. You know what that means? You take the little pictures, eight millimeter, you blow them up 11 by 15, which I had the opportunity to do in December of 2005 as a consultant to Life Magazine with my colleague, Dr. Josiah Thompson, in a room bigger than this, and there laid out in serpentine fashion as you move around, and these X-ray view boxes turned upward, you study the shooting, the assassination of John Kennedy, and the wounding of Governor Connolly at one eighteen second end. There's not a word you can utter, a movement you can make, a thought you can entertain 18 times in one second. Just think, you can study this murder at 1 18th second intervals to see the movement, the position, the juxtaposition, the relative relationships of these men and their wives. The other chronometer was, of course, the alleged murder weapon, a manager carcano. This is a bolt action, non automatic. Are being considered by every long gun expert I've ever spoken to as the most inferior weapon of the genre developed anywhere in the world. It is a joke among long gun experts 
absolutely piece of junk. Um, the uh, site too on this particular manager of Mercado was not even aligned. You have to shoot, unload, reload. And so the government got the best marksman they could find from the FBI and from the um, law enforcement agencies to see how long does it take from shot to shot. Without allowing time for repositioning and re-aiming at a moving target, how long does it take? Shoot, shoot again, 2.3 seconds. Now we come back to the Zipruder film. The Zipruder film clearly shows that John Connolly has struck 1.5 seconds after Kennedy has been hit the first time. I wasn't there. Can you imagine the consternation? Can you imagine this incredible dilemma? Can you imagine what they were mm, dealing with? Lee Harvey Oswald is dead. The reports have been submitted. The president, the Cooper, they've announced to the world that Oswald is all by himself. Nobody else is involved. He's a single shooter. Nobody knew anything going in, coming out, or during the execution of this assassination. Well, how do you deal with this? Oswald had flunked his marksman to test the first time in the U.S. Marines, got a barely passing score the second time around. How do you deal with this? Junior legal counsel of the Warren Commission came up with what is known as, by them, the single bullet theory more aptly and correctly referred to by Mark Lane and myself and others early on as the master of the theory. Arlen Specter, then junior legal counsel, later to become senior United States Senator from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Arlen Specter was the creator, the father of the single bullet theory. Arlen Specter came up with the idea that would solve the day that would uh, take care of the seemingly impossible physical incongruity. We don't have movable chairs here, do we? Uh, that's a shame. Um, can you get two chairs uh, that move? Um, the way they're sitting, and they're looking at the crowd, and they're waving, and they've got, they've got this white Stetson, it's a very nice hat, sir, and he's looking at the crowd. Okay. There, sixth floor, southeast corner, Texas School Book Depository building is Lee Harvey Oswald. Up there, he shoots. The bullet comes down and hits Kennedy a few inches below the crest of the shoulder, slightly to the right of the midline. For openers, under the single bullet theory, that bullet has an upward trajectory of 11 and a half degrees. That's for openers. A bullet that's moving from up downward, from right to left, from back to front, hits here, and exits here. How do my colleagues account for that? Well, they say, what if the president were bent over? He forgot to tie his shoelace, he's scratching his groin, and you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't take my word for it. Look at this Zapruder film. Kennedy was not doing that. He was looking at the crowd. He was enjoying himself, okay? So the bullet comes up. It's moving. It's not struck any bone. Um, possibly uh, touched the vertebrae uh, slightly, but no uh, deviation. It comes up, and the bullet is coming down back to front, right to left, up down. Now, if the bullet struck Connolly over here, grazed his left shoulder, I probably wouldn't be talking to you today. What, is ha what did the bullet do? The bullet came out, moving thusly, turns in midair, comes back about 20 inches, and slams into the governor <coughs> behind the right armpit. The medical language, right posterior axillary area, which simply means behind the armpit. Hits him here, okay? It now proceeds at a downward angle of 27 degrees, exits from below the level of the nipple, pierces first the right lung, destroys five inches of the right fifth rib anteriorly, comes up, is moving downward, it swings up and around, slams into the governor's wrist, produces a comminuted fracture of the distal radius, 
one of the two long bones from the elbow to the wrist. Remember, Conley is six foot four, big bone Texas, not one of the uh, uh, young ladies here weighing 110, 15 pounds. Uh, it comes out then from the front of the wrist, and now it's moving at a downward angle of 45 degrees into his left thigh, goes down several inches, hits the femur, works its way back out into his clothing, <laughs> his clothing onto the stretcher, and as of April 1964, with the Warren Commission report, single bullet theory, Commission Exhibit 399, the stretcher bullet, the hero of the single bullet theory, that bullet is now from John Conley's left thigh. Recapitulated. <laughs> Friday night, the autopsy, the stretcher bullet is from Kennedy's back. Saturday morning, the stretcher bullet is from Kennedy's neck. Five, six months later, under the single bullet theory, the stretcher bullet is from Conley's left thigh. Whatever you want, that bullet happily and readily applies to you. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Let me tell you about the single bullet of 30. In addition to this cockamamie trajectory, this bullet, as I've told you, destroyed five inches of the rib. The radius, if you uh, know your anatomy, look at his skeleton, and I'm sure you did a skeleton somewhere in the building for one of your classes, you'll see that the radius broadens as it comes down and meets the eight small bones of the wrist. It broadens. So it produces a common dude, which means a shattered, fragmented, fractured neck bone. Emerges pristine. Commission Exhibit 399 is essentially a pristine bullet. The nose, the cone, completely intact. The only deformity is at the base from the impact of the firing mechanism. The weight of the bullet, store-bought condition, 161 grains. The bullet as found, the stretcher bullet, Commission Exhibit 399, 158.6 grains. 2.4 grains is exactly one and a half percent. And yet there were pieces of the bullet in Kennedy's chest, Connie's chest, Connie's wrist, Connie's side, most of which were taken to the grave with Connie, and we're told that all of those fragments together only quantitated to one and a half percent of the total mass weight of the bullet in its original condition. And that is totally absurd. How do the Warren Commission defenders deal with this? So I saw a program just this past week with some uh, uh, criminalists, I happen to know them, father and son, and so on. It was very interesting for this particular program. They shot uh, that same kind of ammunition. They shot it through pine wood. They shot it through gelatin. They shot it through Neutrogena soap. Very interesting. Guess what? The word bone was never mentioned. Nobody shot through bone. I have a slide. I got to, I got to blow that thing up and carry it uh, with me. Um, if, if I were told, for whatever reason, I had to give up every single thing that I own pertaining to the JFK assassination. Every book, every article, every letter, every memorandum. I mean, every single thing without exception. And I could keep one thing. One thing. Not a category, not a collection, but one single thing. It would be something that I didn't create. It's from the government. There was somebody on that Warren Commission staff that said, hey, can a bullet do that? Can a bullet break two bones and emerge looking pristine. The shell totally intact, this copper jacketed lead cord military type ammunition, an inch and a quarter in length, a quarter of an inch in diameter. Is it possible? So they did an experiment. And these are experiments that we do, French pathology, criminalists, ballistics, experts, all the time. When you want to match up bullets with guns, when you want to see what a bullet might look like or so on. So they got three sets of targets. First, they shot in the cotton water. When you want to get a bullet that doesn't touch anything, you shoot it either into a barrel of water or you shoot it into cotton water. You're not going to strike anything. You want to just mash it up, grooves and lands, etc., with that particular weapon. So that was their first set of targets. Then they got a bunch of goats and they shot, you know, one at a time, um, one bullet at a 
the time, of course, and they lined him up to break a rib of a goat to simulate Connolly's rib fracture. Then they got human cadavers, and they lined them up to shoot through the radius to simulate Connolly's radial fracture. You should see this slide. Their slide. I don't know how many times they shot in each of these three targeted categories, obviously many times. You see the bullets that went into cotton wadi have the same deformity at the base from the impact of the firing mechanism as you see on 399. Then when you look at the bullet that broke a rib of a goat, it looks for a moment as if it's a different caliber. A little wider, so on. The bullet has been significantly deformed by breaking a rib of a goat. And then you look at the bullet that went through a radius of a human cadaver. As the typical mushrooming, peeling back appearance that we see when bullets strike bones. Which I've seen thousands of times, uh, most recently last week. And so when I present with the visual PowerPoint, I love this. I put up that slide then and I say, for a moment, I'm the prosecutor now. You, good folks, are the jury. I want to thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. You've been patient. You've been a wonderfully attentive group of people. You, your country owes you a deep debt of gratitude sitting here for these eight weeks of the trial. I'm not going to keep you much longer, but I just want to remind you of some of the highlights of the case. And especially I want to talk about what my esteemed colleague representing the defendant, Mr. Oswald, he has ridiculed, he's uh, uh, talked about uh, what he calls the magic bullet theory and so on. I want to show you. It's been a long time, at least two months. I want to remind you, I want to refresh your memories as you go in to deliberate. And then I show that slide. That if a bullet that breaks a rib can look like this, and a bullet that breaks a radius can look like this. Does anybody have a problem in accepting the fact that a bullet that breaks both a rib and a radius can look like this? And there on the far side of the slide is Commission Exhibit 399. This pristine bullet, unscathed, untouched, except the deformity at the base. That's the government's experiment. You haven't seen this, and you won't see it on any of the presentations that try to defend and support and explain and rationalize the Warren Fish Report. Their experiment, not mine, their slide, an experiment that was repeated um, by a couple of other people, professor of uh, topology, University of Kansas, a group in Texas, I uh, was involved in that, now in the actual shooting, evaluating the results and so on. That is the single bullet theory. Throw on top of the absurd trajectory that I have demonstrated, throw on top of the condition of the bullet and the weight of the bullet, other things. John Conley, from the time that he held his first news conference as a patient still in the hospital, and his wife by his side separately, insisted to the days of their respective deaths, there was no question in their minds that the governor was struck by a separate bullet. Marksman to test the timing of the manager Carcano that we talked about. Let's relate that to the head wound. On October 17th, 18th, and 19th, exactly one month ago, we had a fantastic three day conference at Duquesne University, an international conference, the biggest, the best JFK conference anywhere in the country. It was just, just tremendous. We had uh, two or three dozen presentations by uh, erudite and scholarly people, board certified medical specialists, experienced criminal trial attorneys, um, criminal investigators, uh, journalistic investigators, Jefferson Morley, Washington uh, Post for 15 years, recognized book authors, David Talbot, um, founder of Ceylon, um, and uh, author of the book, The Brothers on John and Bobby Kennedy, these kinds of presentations. Oliver Stone was here for two days. He was a member of the panel one of the panels that we conducted on Thursday evening in conjunction with co-sponsorship with the Heinz History Center was titled, How Would the News Media Handle the Assassination of President Kennedy if it were to occur today? Maybe we'll have a couple of minutes to talk about that, but I'm going to stick with the headline for a moment. In 
that program, we had an hour presentation, live TV, Dr. Robert McClellan, one of the chief surgeons at Parkland Hospital, this 82-year-old gentleman, calmly, coherently, lucidly, and as intelligently set forth his thoughts, his findings, his observations. As it turned out, with Kennedy lying there, and the doctors working on the tracheostomy, Dr. McClellan was there holding a retractor just on the right side of the president's head where the wound was. Dr. McClellan stayed unconscious. He was there eight to 10 minutes holding that retractor, 18 inches away at the most from that head wound. This doctor who had examined and treated and dealt with hundreds if not thousands of gunshot wounds over those years at the Parkland Hospital, Dr. McClellan stated, unequivocally that that was a gunshot wound that had been inflicted with a shot fired from the right front. The bullet striking the frontal temporal area just above the sighting in front of the ear and then moving backward and blowing out brain. A piece of cerebellum, he said, actually fell from the brain. The cerebellum located posteriorly and inferiorly uh, part of the brain, but not the two cerebral hemispheres responsible for balance and coordination. Interestingly, in the autopsy report of uh, Humes and Boswell, the guys that did the autopsy, according to them, the cerebellum is intact. And yet every single physician from Parkland Hospital, their testimony then, and their testimony repeated in 1998, before the Assassination Records and Review Board was turning this up again. Again, everyone <coughs> said the same thing about that bullet wound, that massive wound in the neck, in the, uh, in the head. As far as the net wound is concerned, that's interesting too. Uh, Dr. Berry, the chief surgeon, um, he insisted to the day of his death that that was a bullet wound of entrance. It was circular, it was symmetrical, it had inward uh, cratering to some extent, and about a centimeter or so in diameter. Um, that's another interesting aspect of the case. When you put this all together, and then you deal further with highly sophisticated photographic analyses, acoustical analyses of the shots fired, et cetera. Before you even get to the investigative aspects, who was Oswald, what was going on, and so on, just from a forensic scientific standpoint, from the single point of theory to begin with, you see that you've got two shooters. You see, this is the problem. I believe, I can't prove this, I'm not going to go around and even if I took the time, how could I do this to sit down uh, with a, a select bunch of people and, and how would they necessarily be representative? I am, I am convinced in my heart and mind that a big percentage of that minority who believe in the Warren Commission, they're uncomfortable as hell knowing what they have to deal with knowing what the superficiality of the investigation, including the Warren Commission's failure uh, to obtain all the documents, to interrogate all the key witnesses. Uh, an example for of the Warren Commission, they concluded officially that Jack Ruby had just come down in, in a very uh, coincidental fashion to the back ramp of the Dallas Public Safety Board. Lee Harvey Oswald was being left. That Jack Ruby, had just wired money to a former stripper across the street. And lo and behold, when he came out, there's the ramp. And any of you who have been in Dallas that day sightseeing, you too could have walked right down and you could have seen the murderer of the president as he is being led away. And that's the official conclusion of the Warren Commission. It is now an accepted fact by everybody, it's a matter of record, that Jack Ruby was let into the basement of the Dallas uh, the, the Texas Public Safety Building by a high-ranking police official. Jack Ruby was mafia from the age of 17 in Chicago. Jack Ruby was a nightclub operator, a restaurateur, a pimp, a hustler, a gun smuggler. He was a police informant. He was an FBI informant. Damon Runyon on LSD could not have created the character of Jack Ruby. <laughs> but I can give that to you to show you how the Warren Commission dealt with things. The Warren Commission. Chief Justice Earl Warren was described by people who were there as being in tears when he left Johnson's office. 
you know more wanted to head out that commission than uh, you know than I want to uh, take off my clothes and dance naked in front of you on the stage. But Johnson, <laughs> uh, of course, insisted. So meantime, you've got a warrant commission. You've got the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, he's got a few things to do. You've got two U.S. Senators and two United States Congressmen. they got a lot of things to do. So who really ran the Warren Commission? The head of the CIA was a guy named Alan Dulles. Read about him someday. There's a new book out about the Dulles brothers. A horrible human being. A notorious womanizer, a disgusting, uh, highfalutin, arrogant, um, um, classical New England wasp trying to look down on everybody, Catholics, Jews, and blacks, everybody except his crowd uh, was a second class citizen. Alan Dulles was the head of the CIA. John Kennedy came to learn what the CIA was doing. They were doing whatever they wanted to do. It was a separate government. They were overthrowing governments either by political machinations uh, military coups or just assassinating people. Mossadegh and Iran, we probably won't have that situation today, but I don't want to digress there. Mossadegh and Iran, our Benz in Guatemala, Allende in Chile, the Diem brothers in Vietnam, the continuing efforts to assassinate Castro, exploding cigars, poison drinks, and so on. The Bay of Pigs fiasco, Kennedy was inflamed, he was incensed, and there was a scene. Then Majority Leader Senator Mike Mansell, Democratic Party from Montana, in the Oval Room with the President, and the President took a piece of paper, it was a memo, I guess, of some kind, tore it up into pieces, threw it into the air, and said, this is what I intend to do with the CIA. This is what was going on. He fired Alan Dulles. He fired him. So who's appointed to the Warren Commission? Alan Dulles. That makes sense, right? Ask your um, younger brothers and sisters in the 10th grade, those of you who are parents, uh, your 10 year old kid, just uh, give them a, an anonymous type of situation and ask them whether they think it would make sense to put that person onto the commission that's going to investigate the death of somebody. This is what went on. Who ran the commission? The Chief Justice and the Senators and the Congressmen, their attendance rate was about 35 to 40 percent. They were busy. Alan Dulles ran the commission. He determined what would be requested of the CIA, and he determined what the CIA would give. Alan Dulles ran the commission. The man who had been bounced from the CIA directorship by President Kennedy. And on and on it goes. We don't have time to get into all this stuff about uh, Oswald. This is the background. And let me just tell you this. And you know this, you probably haven't thought about it because you're not involved in directly, but just think back to cases, some of which are still going on, but when you had a case of a political assassination or a mysterious death or controversial death of some prominent person, not necessarily a politician, think of how long it takes before you get the final word. I can tell you that I am besieged by news media, uh, every time there's a death, uh, Michael Jackson, or this one, or that one, gee, uh, <coughs> how long does it take? Why do we have to wait two, three months, and so on? I explained to them why they're waiting. They're not waiting for tests. That's a lot of poppycock. DNA testing now is done in three days. Toxicology testing is done in a couple days, or three or four days, um, uh, the most esoteric test. These things are all done. It's taking that long because they're checking out every single thing. It involves drugs, every pharmacist, every doctor, every person, every friend. If it involves guns, in this case, the assassination of the president in daylight in Dallas and in three days, and Oswald is conveniently dead now, of course, in three days, Hoover is announcing to the world that the case is all over. He has determined in three days, and that includes Saturday, Sunday weekend, by the way, that nobody else is involved. He has ruled out everybody. Well, I'll agree with them to a point. They did rule out the Russians and the Cubans and the Chinese damn fast. Nobody wanted to start seeing nuclear bombs dropped around the world, which is, of course, what would have happened. They did rule them out. You bet your life they ruled them out. And having ruled them out, 
they then were left with the inevitable conclusion. There was a wonderful comic strip character I love so much, a possum, his name was Pogo. There was a great line in one strip, when we have met the enemy and he is us. And that's what they were confronted with. When we have met the enemy and he is us. John Kennedy was gonna be reelected for sure. What the military industrial CIA complex was looking at was five more years of John Kennedy. Most likely every political pundit would have given odds that Bobby Kennedy was gonna follow eight more years. This wasn't the ball game, way to wing it up in the ninth inning. Wait until the second half of the football game. What about the third period of the hockey game? 13 years is a lifetime in the political evolution of a country. 13 years. Kennedy had already signed an order to withdraw our ground troops from Vietnam. Kennedy was going to eliminate or totally revise, make over the CIA. Kennedy was establishing a, a warming relationship, it wasn't going to end overnight, but he was developing a nice relationship with Nikita Khrushchev in the warming of the Cold War. He was dealing things in a whole different fashion. Domestically, he was pushing for voting rights and civil rights, things that the South was unhappy with. And most importantly, at the international level, things that the military, industrial, and CIA tech complex simply were not going to tolerate. Well, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? You can't beat John Kennedy in the polls. With his power, his graciousness, his charm, his financial support, his backing, the groups that followed him all the way across the board, no way in the world you're going to defeat John Kennedy or Bobby Kennedy. No way. There's only one way to deal with that. And if you're one of these ultra right-wing super patriots, you hear something that regular folks like us don't hear when the Star Spangled Banner is played, when the flag is flying, you see more than any of us regular old fashioned American patriots uh, see. It is not your cup of tea. You're not gonna tolerate that. You're not gonna sit back for 13 more years. There's only one way to deal with it, and that is the elimination <coughs> of the president. That is what this was all about. You overthrow the government. When it happens in any other country of the world, we're very quick. And are sometimes uh, smart, arrogant, rational <coughs> as Americans, not to hesitate to label it what it is. Only when it happens in our country do we hesitate to call it. It is a coup d'etat in America that would overthrow the government. That's what the assassination of President Kennedy was all about. And that's why this case must be reopened. You all know about cold uh, cases. I just testified last week in Beaver, a murder case going back to 1979. I just did a television since the case is not so terribly cold. Um, Brittany Murphy, some new stuff coming out about heavy metal poisoning possibly and so on. And they're talking about exhuming a body. I've dealt with cases in which bodies have been exhumed uh, after decades. Um, and well, actually one the case from Kentucky years ago bodies went back to the middle of the 19th century, having to do with identifying bodies and graves on another uh, type of map. So cold cases are part of the thing. Law enforcement the people, they just love it. Uh, you see young detectives come in and they're going to show they're going to take some cold case and boy, they're going to run with it and it's going to make them a hero for some young friends, pathologists or forensic scientists and so on. So cold cases, that's the thing. And there are research grants being given by the federal government and so on. But it's very interesting. With all this kind of evidence, with all of this hard forensic scientific evidence, if it were Joe Jones, Tom Smith, Barry Brown, you could bet your life this case would be reopened. The body would be exhumed, examinations would be conducted. The government is withholding 1,171 documents, approximately 50,000 pages as we speak today. Now tell me this too. This is Lee Harvey Oswald. He's just a soul nut. He's a pro-communist, and he kills the president, something which he denied to his dying moments, by the way, when I'm trying to get into the whole background of Lee Harvey Oswald. But pray tell, explain to me. I want somebody to tell me. A legal scholar, a judge, uh, anybody. I want somebody to tell me. What is the purpose? What is all of this being held back? It took me years to get into 1972 as the first non-government supported pathologist 
to see the autopsy materials when I pointed out that the president's brain was missing and remains missing 41 years later, along with several photographs and x-rays and microscopic tissue slides that we use to differentiate microscopically between entrance and exit. Why are these things being withheld? Well, not kill the president or the rest of the Nobody else is involved. Nobody knows anything. Nobody did anything wrong. Okay, just, just do it, man. What's it all about? Think about that. Just use common sense. You don't have to be a forensic scientist. You don't even have to be a forensic scientific criminal justice student. Just be a thinking human being. Does it make sense to you? Does it fit? Is it likely? Is it possible? The answer is, of course, no. And that's why this case really needs to be broken. And I think for those of you, most of you are students here today, it will happen in your lifetimes. Another generation or two, I think it's going to take before the progeny of all of those political, executive, governmental, administrative people that are now far enough removed from great granddaddy, not the biological genetic great granddaddies, but you know, their their political forefathers uh, to be far enough removed so that they won't be accused of pissing on great granddaddy's grave. It's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. And it must happen. It's important. This is democracy. This is something that we owe ourselves um, and we owe our, our children and future generations. We don't let something like this pass by. It's more than more than a murder, not that any murder is to be ignored. There's no statute of limitations, as you all know, on murders and so on. But this was the president. And I, as I've said, it was not an assassination conducted by anybody else other than fellow Americans.